Okay, you can go. Yeah, all right. So the topic is working with APIs on iOS, which sort of means Objective-C or Swift. I'm mainly going to be focusing on Objective-C on this talk. Um, and we can talk about Swift, I guess, potentially later. But um, the focus for me would be Objective-C and the, the huge legacy way of doing iOS applications and dealing with APIs. Um, before I go much further, uh, can I get people to raise their hands if you've dabbled in Objective-C or iOS application development before? Okay, so four or five, I guess, all right. Um, not sure how deep you guys are into this, so you know some of this content may be repetitive or, or somewhat basic, but I wanted to give sort of a, um, a base understanding for how things work with uh, Objective-C and the core APIs especially with JSON and, and remote APIs, as in network connectivity and, and HP requests, that kind of stuff. So um, about me, I've been building apps since 2008 when the SDK came out, um, sort of a, as a, as a part-time thing on, on the side. I had a full-time job at that point, um, doing things not really related to, to this stuff, and then I got enough business happening on the side that I was able to quit my that job in 2011 and start doing this stuff full time. And that's what I do up to now. I'm a full time freelancer. I help companies here in Houston and, and outside of Houston build m mobile applications either on iOS or Android. Um, my company is called Ipanema Labs and I work out of my home office in the Woodlands. Um, as, as Joseph said, I'm the founder and organizer of the Houston iPhone Developers Meetup, and I'm also the organizer of the Houston PHP Users Group, which is another meetup. Um, not very active right now, but I'd love to get that going again. Um, so as some background for what I've done in the past, this is sort of my first um, semi-serious app that I built back in 2009. Um, it's still in the store. I mean, you can buy it right now. It'll be cool. Um, <laughs> it's, it's sort of a simple app. I, I built it mainly as a way to learn the APIs and how to build applications for, for the iPhone. I, at that point, I didn't really have much experience with native development. I was a PHP developer. I, I, I knew how to build websites and backend systems with MySQL and databases and things like that. So it was kind of a completely new thing to me, both the Mac and iOS development in itself, just Objective-C, it's sort of a, a different language, right? It's, it doesn't seem like the usual language that you have with C-like languages or Java. Um, the square brackets are kind of weird and it takes a little bit of time for you to think as an Objective-C developer or as a, or as a, as a Cocoa developer as it may. So this, is, this was my first application. You know, I actually hired a designer for this stuff. I went through the process of putting it on a store. Not very, um, not very successful, as in I'm, I, I'm not really rich out of this, but um, you know, it was a, a good learning experience. Um, sort of a super niche idea, as in this is, application was built so that I would remember who owes me money and who I owe money to as in you go for lunch with your buddies and you pay one time, the other person pays the next time and this is just a way of remembering, that was it. So this is my biggest client called HAR. Um, started with them in 2010, still as a, as a side project or a side freelance project and I'm still with them. I'm the, the, the single developer behind the iOS application initially on the iPhone and eventually on 2011 on the iPad as well. Um, it's a really big and complex application because it's both a tool for consumers to find, you know, um, houses to buy or to rent or whatever. But it's all there's also sort of a side um, sort of features that are available to realtors. So when realtors log into this application, then they can do a whole bunch of stuff that consumers can't. But it's still very useful and. Um, very popular. This is one of the top ten, top 
10,000 publications on the store, which is sort of a big deal since we have like a million apps on the store or something. So it's top 1% app, I guess, I don't know. Um, this is one other application I built for the same HAR client in 2013. It was sort of a um, sort of a partnership with the city of Houston to build a, a an application to serve as a resource for Houston uh, citizens on how to to see what's available nearby them, like events and things to do, as well as get them involved with the political side of the city and, and their 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 the, the ways to, to sort of get involved. Um, so this is available on the store, both on, on the iPhone and on the iPad. And over the past year or so, I've been working on the redesign of the HAR app, which is going to be launching hopefully pretty soon. Um, another huge project, redesigning the app from scratch to work better with the new, at this point it's not really new anymore, but the newish iOS 7, iOS 8 design of things. Um, so that's pretty much me. Um, so working with APIs on iOS, um, you know, what does that mean? Usually, it's sort of a, a general sort of topic, but it, it usually means working with a remote API of some sort. You know, what I mean by that, it's sort of a web service, right, which is what a lot of people call it. Um, there's a piece of software running on a server somewhere, and you connect to that API or to that service uh, via well-documented, um, ways to probe that service for information and then eventually you would get the information and display it on the screen on on, on this case as, a, as an iOS application either you know like on on this example here you know I, I got the, the, the properties to list there those four or, or three properties that were for sale uh, f through this remote API right there's documentation on how to call it, what parameters I can pass it to say, hey, I'm interested on houses for sale, not for rent, and I like to see houses for sale between the prices of such and such and whatever, right? And I would like to see them on a zip code of you know, 77002, whatever. So that API can then do whatever business logic it needs to do on the server side to grab the information and then send it back to the client, on this case, an iPhone application. But kind of the same thing happens for Android applications, Windows Phone applications, it doesn't really matter what it is. That's usually how you get data in and out of these back-end systems. Um, used to be that a lot of these remote API uh, systems would work with XML. Um, these days, the vast majority of them uses JSON. Are you guys familiar with JSON, the format? Yeah. Sort of? Okay. So here's an example of a JSON document. Um, oops. So uh, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So it's sort of a subset of JavaScript in that what this is defining is an object, right? The curly braces around the whole content define an object. The, the, the values there that have a little, you know, double quotes uh, around them, those are the titles or, you know, the, 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 the names of the properties inside of that object. And the values to, to the right side of the, the colon are the actual values associated with those properties. So if I would assign this object to a variable in JavaScript, I could actually access the title value, which is, in this case, null, um, by just doing object.title. If you're familiar with JavaScript, I think you know what I'm talking about. But you know, So this is JSON. It's, it's just a way of encoding information in a specific format um, that uh, pretty much all object, uh, all programming languages know how to deal with, and, and this is the, the format. It's sort of well-defined, and it sort of defines what's, what are the possible values that you can have, and this is, um, this is the, 
the seven types of, of values that you can have on the, again, on the right side of the little colon or, or anything really being, um, being encoded. You can either have a string, a number, object, an array, true or false, or basically a Boolean value or, or the, 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 the null value. Um, and the idea is, again, that you can pass information between systems. You can, you know, encode a particular document or, or a particular object in this format. And then if you're writing something in Java, you can do whatever you want to do in Java and then encode your response in, in this format and then send it off to an iOS application or maybe to a PHP application, it doesn't matter. And that application will be able to, um, to, to decode that value from a string, which is basically this JSON document, into an actual object in Objective-C or PHP or whatever it may be. So that's the idea behind JSON. It's just another data format. Um, so like I said, you know, the old way of doing things would be by encoding things in, in an XML format, but the way things are done right now, uh, mostly it's done through JSON. It, it's easy to read because there's not so much markup around the data, and it's, it's, very, it's very concise. There's not a ton of extra fluff that you have to ignore while reading the, the, the content. The JSON is pretty much just a, a pretty Pretty, pretty simple format. So if you had to work with an API that was serving JSON encoded form, uh, documents, then the, the old way of doing things, as in pre-2012 or 2013 or whatever, would have been to use touch JSON or JSON kit or the libraries that were available for Objective-C development. Lately, though, you don't need to do that anymore, as in Apple started shipping their own Objective-C-like uh, framework or library that deals with encoding and decoding JSON into native objects, and that is called NSJSON serialization. So if you, if you ever need to deal with a, an old device that doesn't really run iOS 7 or iOS 6 even, then you could potentially worry about this, but and that's JSON serialization is the way to go. Um, again, I sort of touched on, on this. This is our example JSON document that we're going to be using. Um, you know, there's a title property and the value is null. There's a results property and the value is an array of four strings. Uh, there's a total property which the value is a number for, and then more content which the value is just a Boolean through value. So, you know, a bunch of different sort of data types all encoded on the same thing. This can be recursive, as in I could have an array of objects or I could have an array of Boolean values and, you know, you, you can do whatever you want as far as the, 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 the format goes. This is just a super simple version of a document and you're probably not going to see something this simple on, on a real API. An API would usually give you an array of documents or array of results and each result would probably be um, an object, right? You would have the little curly braces around the whole thing. There would be maybe the square brackets of an array and then each item on the array would be a little, a little object with information about each item that's being returned or something like that. But, so this could be potentially uh, a single entry being returned from an API or something like that. But this is just a simple example of what you could do with, with JSON. And parsing JSON, so this is a, an example in Objective-C of how to do this. Um, JSON document string, str, would be the little string object that would contain the actual JSON document. So all of this would be inside of that variable there. Um, then you just pass that method there, data using encoding, and you specify UTF-8 as the encoding for that piece of, piece of string. And then you get back an NSData object, which you can then pass to NSJSON serialization to actually get the real live object on Objective-C to deal with whatever this may be encoding. 
right? So in this case, this you could, you know, what this is going to respond with is going to be an NS dictionary for the outer object, right, with title result and object and I mean, title results total and more content as the keys and the values for that dictionary would be whatever it's being uh, specified on the right side of the columns. Um, but this is basically the way you would parse JSON on iOS. Now, like I was saying, you know, if, if you were to parse the JSON into a little object, which is JSON object on this case, the last line, then using J JSON object, which would be a dictionary, you could then ask it for the title or maybe for the list of names, that array, or maybe for the Boolean content from that more content um, property, right? So this is kind of how you, you would parse this document with results, total, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things would be um, parsed and, and available to you through this dictionary. Um, it only happens this way because the outer object of this document is a dictionary. If it was just an array, then you wouldn't get an, a, a dictionary while calling JSON object with data. You would get an array back or whatever it may be, right? Uh, but this is just an example of how to, to, to parse the JSON and deal with the results that you're getting from the remote API. At this point, we're not really talking about how to get the data from the remote API, just that let's assume that you got it. You have a, a string from it or whatever you're, 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 you're getting from it. You know, how to, how to get real data and real live objects from it. Um, so that's parsing and then generating JSON. It's kind of similar to that, but the other way around, let's assume that you have an array of, of, of names and you want to and you want to encode that as JSON to then pass it to another program some, somewhere. Um, this is how you do it. You, you have your NS array object with the three names in them. And then again, you use NS JSON serialization, this, this class from Apple, to get an NS data object from your array on this case. And then after you get that encoded uh, data set from it, you can then convert that into a string, which in this case is actually going to be the JSON string, as in the JSON encoded version of that live object, that array in this case. And the output is what you see here on the last item, which is just Joe, Bob, and Mary, or whatever. Um, but, you know, like I was saying, this is the JSON encoded version of a, of a real live object. If you were dealing with a dictionary, then it wouldn't be a square object, a square, a square brace like this, you would be a curly brace or whatever. So, um, so networking, the other side of dealing with APIs is you actually need to connect to this remote server to ask for information or to maybe send information. Um, you know, like I said, most of the time you're going to be dealing with a remote API running on some web server. That's usually the way you, you do these things, and that's certainly how you would do it if you were dealing with the Twitter API or the Instagram API or whatever it is. It's the same thing. You're, 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 you're passing parameters to this API to say, give me the list of photos for this user for the last hour or whatever it is. And all of those sort of parameters, what the username is for the user, or uh, what you want from the API, I want the list of photos, or what's the, the timeline that you're interested in, I'm interested in one hour. All of those things are usually parameters to an API, it's, or things that you either pass it through GET, um, HTTP GET, right, just writing server.com slash API, question mark, time equals one hour, and username equals whatever username, stuff like that, right? So you're passing parameters to this API somehow, either through get or maybe post or whatever it is, and then you're getting information back. So that's usually how these APIs are, are, are built these days. They receive parameters through 
HTTP, again through GET or POST or whatever, and then they send, they respond with information encoded in JSON usually um, by, by just simply returning that information like, like, uh, like, like it was a browser. Like if you, if you went to, to an API and you passed those parameters through your browser, you would see JSON coming back in your browser window. Um, so you have three ways, there's more than three ways, but you know, three main ways uh, to do this on iOS with uh, Objective-C even. Uh, you have NS URL connection, which is basically the standard. It's been around for a long time. NS URL session, which is sort of a new API that came out, I think, with iOS 7. Um, and then AF networking, which is a third party library. Uh, by the way, NS URL. URL connection and NS URL session are both standard uh, libraries, as in those are provided by Apple. Usually anything you see with NS in front of them is an Apple thing, sort of an Apple API that they wrote, they make it available, and it's always available on Objective-C. Perhaps you just need to import a couple of headers on, on your code to make that really available to you, but they're, they're always available to you. AF networking though, you know, again, it's not NS, it's prefixed with AF. So it's sort of a third party library. It, it was built by the community. You can download this, this library of, of code and then include it on your project on Xcode and compile it with your application and make use of, of that piece of code. This is extremely popular, as in most apps these days don't really use NS0 connection or NS0 session. They, probably use AF networking. Um, and you see the reason in a little bit why you, you would use AF networking. AF networking as a library, either this one or, or others, there, there are other libraries available. Um, each one has its own little advantage. You know, this is written a specific way or maybe this other one is built for whatever scenario that, that might be um, most useful for. But they're pretty much always built on top of these other um, APIs. So AF networking is built on top of NS Europe session. It's just written in a way that it's more convenient to you as a developer. It either makes your code simpler to write, or even sometimes even simpler to write and simpler to read later and understand what's happening. And I'll go through a few examples here and show you, you know, really quickly why this is so much better or potentially so much simpler to use than these, these other APIs. The idea was NS URL connection and NS URL session were built as a um, sort of a core, core functionality of iOS and even Mac OS so that you, whenever you ever need to deal with a remote server or you know, HTTP server or otherwise, you would use these these libraries and you would pretty much work with whatever it's available out there. Um, so it's made in a way that is very generic and it's also very flexible in a way. There's lots of callbacks you have to, to use. Um, so it's kind of kind of a pain to use in a, in, in a few situations if you're just doing something really simple. Uh, it starts being kind of a drag to use these APIs because you have to do a lot of setup just to do something super simple like requesting a file from a server. Um, so this is an example of an NS URL connection um, type, of, type of, a, of an app. Let's say this is a view controller in this case. Um, are you guys familiar with view controllers? Okay. It's a view controller that is loading content from a server somewhere. Um, and you know, on, on this example, we're using an SEO connection. So the way it works is you have to, it's, it's an asynchronous API in that I'm gonna call something to request that file, but then the next line of code that it, it executes, it's not after it downloads the the, the file, right? It's right after you queued it up to run on the background later. So the next, if, if I were to add another line after this line, it would run right away, and it would run right away 
uh, without the contents of that file, right? So it's, it's sort of a different way of implementing code, which, like I said, I came from a PHP background, which is a blocking background. So when you request a file or something, when you read a file from disk or whatever it is, the next line of code that executes, I would have access to that, to that content of that file. This is not how it works with an SRL connection. And most APIs on iOS are asynchronous this way. Um, so what I was trying to get at is, let's say you are loading uh, a JSON file from a server, and this is the same JSON file that we were looking at previously on, on the browser. Um, I would create an NS URL um, object to represent that remote URL for that one file. I would create a request object, and then I would pass that to the URL connection object. And you would queue up to run as soon as possible, basically. Um, but as you do that, you have to assign a delegate, which means as, you, as the, the, the core library, the URL connection uh, library runs and gets the data, it's going to tell you, your code, your view controller, that things are progressing, right? So if it's, a, if it's a 10 megabyte file and it takes 30 seconds to download or more, then as time passes, you're going to be notified of how that download is happening. And the way you do that is, is you, you define and, and, you, and you write code here on specific function names that are going to be called on your object. So when you do delegate, you say self, which means the object for this class, the view controller, right? So the view controller is instantiated in memory. It's running, right? There's a, there's a live object running, and it's going to call this function to request the file from the server, and it's going to say, hey, as you download this stuff, here's the delegate. You should tell this object. And the object is just myself. It's just the view controller. Um, so. As that happens, then these are the callback methods that this, um, this delegate or this protocol, which is what's called an object of C, um, that, the, the, that library is going to be calling. So the names need to be very specific. It needs to match this signature, right? This, this, this format of the function names and things like that. But as that download or, or that request for the file happens, then these methods are going to be called. So the first one that's going to be called is this method that is called connection did receive response. So as soon as this, the, this code actually can connect to the server and, and, and opens the connection, it's going, to, it's going to call this method. So at this point, you need, to, um, you need to create sort of a buffer in a way in memory to hold the data that you're going to be downloading from the server. And I do that by building this little property on my view controller object called response data. If I go back one slide, you see that right there at the top. NS mutable data. So it's just like that NS data object that we were dealing with before on those other examples, but this time is a mutable version of that, which basically means that as I get data from the server, I basically just append into this buffer. I keep appending to the end of it. Um, if you were to use NS data with, with this instead of NS mutable data, it wouldn't work that way. You would only be able to create it once. You would have a buffer and you would be able to pass data into it, but you would not be able to just pin stuff to it. That's NS mutable data. So on this case, whenever I open the connection to the server and I start receiving data from it, I just uh, instantiate this, this object, I actually, you know, initialize it. It's the, the usual alloc init uh, set methods. And then when it starts receiving data, this other delegate method is going to be called connection did receive data. And in this case, I get an NS data object by the library itself. And then I can just append that to, to my NS mutable data property on my, on my object. So again, it's just that conceptual thing. I instantiate a, a, a buffer that is just empty initially, and I, as, receive, as I receive data, it's going to just come and I just keep 
you know, appending to, to, my, to my buffer. And then the, the final point is when the whole thing finishes, then there's another uh, function that gets called, which is called connection did finish loading. And then at this point, all of the data has been downloaded. And then at this point, we can actually parse that NS mutable data object just via the same API or the same um, class uh, features that, that I mentioned before, right, that we went through on the other examples. So it's just NS JSON serialization. You pass the NS data object to it. On this case, it's not NS data object. It is NS mutable data object, but it's the same thing. NS mutable data um, extends NS data. Um, so you just pass that to that uh, method and you receive back an object. And on this case, it's this JSON object that you got back. And it's just like what I described before. It's going to be a dictionary with, uh, what was it? It was total, results, title, and then more content, whatever it is. So it's basically the same logic, but this time actually being used on a real application, on a real program. If you had an error while doing all of this stuff, let's say you lost connectivity in the middle of downloading that file, or I don't know, if you were driving and you entered the tunnel or whatever, then eventually the connection would fail, and then you know this this delegate, which on this case is the view controller, would receive this message: connection did fail with error, and you would have a little NS error object that you could probe for the message and you could display that to the user potentially if you wanted to let them know that this download didn't work, please try again, you know, things like that. So that's kind of how you would do things with NS URL connection. Uh, doesn't seem like that big of a deal, however, I just had to explain this stuff on three slides, right? This stuff, just to download a single JSON file, it's kind of a pain. You have to specify all of those things and there's tons of other details that it can go through, like caching, how does it work with the server, and potentially you wanted the, the, the library to handle the caching for you if you were downloading an image, perhaps. Let's say if we're dealing with um, an application kind of like Instagram, or even Twitter, it doesn't matter, where there's a little icon for the user, right? There's a little picture, a little thumbnail for the user. You don't want to be downloading that image every single time you scroll. If you scroll down and then you scroll up again, for, for that image to be downloaded from the server again, you want that to be cached on disk, on, on, on the device, right? As you use the system, it just primes the cache, it keeps downloading stuff and saving it locally. So that if you run the app maybe two days later, you don't have to re-download that image again. You can just just use that. So there's much more complication to, to this than I've raised over, but this is kind of a pain to deal with. This is the AF networking example. That's it. There's no, there are no other slides. This is it. So it was built to simplify all of those things that we just went over, right? Caching and delegates and what happens when you get the data back or whatever. This is just a simple example on how to get the data back and not really have, having to worry about building a, a, a buffer object for handling the download as it happens because you kind of have to do that with an SUR connection. On this case, the data just comes back on this um, on this uh, on this parameter called response object. And it's pre-parsed for you. You don't need to parse that. So you don't need to worry about NS JSON serialization and instantiating things, getting an NS data object or whatever. This does it all for you. It knows that you're dealing with a JSON file because the server res usually responds with application JSON as a data type. When it serves the content to you, it says that. So it knows that it's JSON, so it just parses for you. So, and builds uh, an actual object for you to use. Um, and if you ever need to deal with that type of, of use case where you're downloading a very large file from the server and you need to be notified 
as the file is downloaded because it's a big one and you need to show a progress bar or something. Then there are other ways to do this stuff, but this is just the basics. It's super simple. The basics on an SEO connection requires three slides to go over. The basics on NF networking is just a few lines of code. So it's a much simpler process for doing super simple stuff, which is the majority of cases were when you would do an application on iOS or Android. Um, and you don't have to worry about all of that, all of those details that you, you kind of have to worry about with an SEO connection. Um, but like I said, it works exactly the same way. And I have an, an application here on Xcode that I can show you that it's kind of boring because it, all it does is just downloads the JSON and prints the what it what it downloaded. But it pretty much works the same way at a fraction of 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 the lines of code. The other thing that's sort of interesting about this, and and this is sort of why it's 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 useful, I think, is. Whenever you write this code, you know exactly what's going to happen because you're looking two lines down, right? I mean, you wrote the line to instantiate the manager object, and then you wrote the second line to actually do a request, which is a get on this URL. You're passing no parameters, you're passing nil to it. And whenever the results come back, it calls this success block. This is a Objective C block, it's just an anonymous function. Um, but that function is going to be called whenever the, the connection finishes what happens, right? I mean, you're looking at this, it's requesting this file, and this is what happens. When you look at NS0 connection, you would be at the top of the, the file, then there's this init re request, you pass the request, and then you instantiate the connection. And then to know exactly what happens, you have to ignore these function calls related to just setup of this buffer object, and then you kind of have to go through the serialization and, and decoding of J JSON, and then you actually see the results uh, upon a successful request. So with this, it's just easy. You get you get the response right away. You can deal with the with with dealing with those results, either an image or a thumbnail or whatever it is, and then displaying it to the screen. And then if there's a failure, there's the little failure callback or or block right here too that you can deal with. So this is a much simpler and much more concise way to do basically the same thing that you would do with an SEO connection. And again, this is all an SEO connection deep down, right? This API that someone wrote on the community, it's just a, sort of a wrapper on top of an SEO connection. It's just a convenience method on top of an SEO connection so you don't have to worry about all of those details like caching and things like that. So, um, so if networking has CocoaPod support, not sure if you guys are familiar with that, but that could be the topic of a whole another session. But um, it's just a way of easily um, be notified if there's a new version of the code and then integrating that with, with, with your project and things like that. There's great documentation available in Coco Docs, um, and tons of tutorials and articles available on the web uh, on, on this library um, for things that are, are not just described on this example, right? This is a simple example of just requesting um, the content from a URL, but if you were downloading um, an image, or maybe you were uploading a file to a server, like someone selected their new profile photo on, on your social network or whatever that you're building, you know, how to upload that to the server. So there's, it, it, you would do that with an HTTP post upload, it needs to, to use a different uh, encoding format, so all of that kind of stuff is possible with AF networking, it just uses a slightly different syntax, slightly different uh, method calls that you can use to, to do that, which is still pretty great. And again, you have articles to, to help you along the way. Um, this is a simple example of how you would request the JSON file, and again, this is just requesting an actual file on my server, but um, the way you would usually deal with an API, it's not really like this, right? You would be passing parameters to an API endpoint to some special URL that takes parameters and then 
runs whatever business logic and returns data to you. Um, so the, the realistic version of the NF, AF networking example, the more complex version would be to create an, a subclass of this, of this AF HTTP session manager um, class and then put your business logic related to API in there, things like your API keys, like authenticating this request or you know, all of this kind of stuff that are potentially specific to your API that you're writing on the server, uh, you would put on this subclass, on this little little object that you're writing, and, and then use that subclass when dealing with your API. Then you would just, you know, if you're doing an Instagram clone, you would just say, get photos for username, and then you would pass a username. And the result of this whole thing would be an array of, of photos or, or posts or whatever model object that you're building on, on your application. But that's kind of how you would usually build these systems. AF networking would just sort of be a component that helps you build this, this software a little bit easier or um, in, in a simple way potentially. Um, so Another thing that I think would be kind of cool to, to mention is NS Screencast, which is sort of a local production here in Houston. Um, ben uh, is, is the guy that runs this, this, this website. They have a great episode on, on AF networking. It's, it's, uh, it's a screencast, right? So you can actually see someone building an application or using this library. Uh, and they go over the details on how to do what I just mentioned, creating a subclass of this thing and using it to, to, to interface with your API or, or stuff like that. There's even source code available for free that you don't have to pay or anything like that. Um, so a few tips, I guess. Um, JSON Lint is a website, a free thing that you can, that you can use to validate JSON. So if you're dealing with, uh, with an API and you want to see, or maybe you're building your API and you want to make sure this is available or maybe something's not working on your app, there are all kinds of reasons of why things are not working. It could be that one of them, that the JSON is just invalid. Whatever you're generating on the server side may be incorrect or may have a syntax error somehow. Um, so JSON lint is an easy way to validate JSON that it is indeed correct and then maybe as you as you get a jumbled up version so it's minified version of the, the response from a server you can pass it to it and it will give you a, a more readable version nicely indented and stuff like that that you can that you can use. Um, HP client is a native Mac application uh, that you can use to inspect APIs to build to, to build these HP requests to, to remote APIs and see you know what what they return things like that um, instead of just doing it manually on a text editor somehow and writing up the URL manually you could do it through HP client and getting the results right away right in there looking at the the headers that the, the server sends back and um, if, if there's an error coming back, an actual status code from the server, all of that kind of stuff you can inspect with this little Mac application. Um, but that's about it. This is my, these are my contact details. And that's it. Any questions? to look up, I guess, free ones that deal with PDFs, for example. Like what? Um, like iTextpedia, that's a JavaScript library that's native. But yeah, but to do what with PDFs? Oh, well, to manipulate them, and combine them, and split them apart, that kind of thing. Oh, uh, 